Reps ignore public outrage and passes Buhari's 23.7 trillion naira extra budgetary spending as President-elect Bola Tinubu is to inherit 46 trillion naira debt from the current administration. This is Plus Politics and I am Mary Anacom. Despite outrage at Wednesday's Senate approval of President Muhammad Buhari's request to restructure uh, the 23.7 trillion naira loan from the Central Bank of Nigeria extended to the federal government under its ways and means provision, uh, the House of Representatives yesterday assented to the president's controversial CBN overdraft. Recall that the federal government had said it would repay the loan, which is uh, which was at, as at December of 2022 um, at 23.7 trillion naira with securities such as treasury bills and bonds issuance. Buhari had in December of 2022 asked both chambers of the National Assembly to approve his proposal, but the lawmakers who had promised to consider the request before proceeding for the election break failed to list it for consideration during plenary in January. When President Muhammad Buhari begged Nigerians for forgiveness, many said much damage had been done to the nation's economy. Now, the incoming administration will have to face the challenge of repaying these heavy debts. Uh, the 46.25 trillion naira debt excludes the 369 billion naira loan approval from the present uh, government. Uh, well, approval that the present government claims it received from the World Bank uh, to cushion the effect of fuel subsidy uh, removal for the implementation of June 2023. Now, joining us to discuss this and more is uh, Babatunde Badamasi. He is a former governorship candidate and a former senatorial candidate with the People's Democratic Party. Thank you so much, Mr. Badamasi, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Let's start with the fact that recently, if I'm not mistaken, um, the IMF and the World Bank had raised eyebrows as to our debt profile and had on several occasions pointed at that some of these monies that we're loaning from them were not put into the right kind of infrastructural development um, that would make or justify these monies that are being taken. As we speak, um, the, um, the finance minister and the attorney general had been summoned by the National Assembly uh, to come and tell us about $200 million um, that has not been accounted for. I mean, the list is endless, and more and more monies uh, are being taken as loan, but half the time, the average Nigerian is asking, where did the money go? Okay, um, first of all, I think it's important to state this. Buhari has always been financially irresponsible. He's always been financially reckless, and uh, controversy has always... Controversy over money, over disappearing money, has always followed him in almost every public uh, position that he's ever taken. Uh, for instance, he was the Minister for Oil during the Obas and Jory team when $2.8 billion was alleged to have disappeared under his watch. Um, we are told uh, that the reason for the coup of, for the military coup of uh, December 31st, 1983 was because the Senate, then headed by uh, uh, Senator Saraki, Senator Olushola Saraki, the father, of the you know, yes. the, the man who was to later become the president of the Eighth Senate, mm. Senator Bukala Saraki, had discovered an account in uh, the then Midland Bank in London, and um, that account was in his name, and the money was apparently, allegedly, there. Uh, and they were going to bring him up for, you know, uh, for charges, you know, um, fraud charges, corruption charges, whatever. And it was then he uh, slyly, you know, uh, initiated his boys and got them to um, got them to carry out the coup against the civilian democratically elected government at the time. There was that one. Then there was uh, the PTF funds, about $28 billion, that was supposed to have disappeared under his watch as chairman of the PTF under the Abacha administration. The man that uh, he apparently outsourced his, his job to at the time, Juan Sirajo, was killed 
just as the Obasanjo Joy administration uh, began to look into the affairs of the PTF. So all the evidence basically just disappeared. Uh, now he's president, and it's been a borrowing fest. He's been borrowing recklessly, you know, without regard to uh, normal financial rules. I mean, like uh, this this latest one that's been uh, recently approved by the uh, National Assembly is basically an illegal loan that he's taken from the Central Bank against the law. Uh, the CBN Act actually places a 5% cap, that is 5% of the previous budget, mm -hmm. on any borrowings from the CBN under Section 38 of Section 1. But Buhari has exceeded that 5% and borrowed to the tune of over 2,000%. Not 10%, not 20%, not 50%. Over 2,000% has been borrowed illegally from the central bank. And without checking, without carrying, an, or carrying out an audit to ensure that the money was spent for what it was taken for, the National Assembly has criminally, typically, gone ahead and approved the loan to be securitized against Nigeria's treasury bills, bonds, and so on, so that Nigerians will now be paying for, uh, will now be paying that loan over the next 40 years at an interest rate of 9%. I think that's unconscionable. I personally think that Buhari should be arrested and tried for serious economic and financial crimes um, when he leaves office. I believe that every lawmaker that voted for that um, request should also be probed, investigated properly, prosecuted and if possible, convicted for economic and financial crimes, huh. um, abuse of office at the very minimum. Because what they've done is they've basically sunk Nigeria financially. That's what they've done. I mean, look at how long it took the Obasanjo administration and the effort that it took them to wipe out the loan, interestingly, borrowed by the same Buhari when he was military head of state, as usual, recklessly. You know, that money was initially borrowed by him, and it carried on from one administration to the next, from one administration to the next, until it got to the Obasanjo administration, and it had become about $31 billion. Mm -hmm. So they, they managed to obtain uh, debt forgiveness for most of it, and because they were able to prove that the, the loans were obnoxious, um, and they paid off the balance, okay? Left the Jonathan administration with very minimal debt and a huge uh, foreign reserve. The Jonathan administration still left a massive foreign reserve for the for the uh, Buhari administration, and he's, he spent the whole lot, he's squandered it, what? and left us with a huge debt of a hand. What, what, I think but that's not that's not what that's not what Garba Shehu. I'm so sorry to talk over you. That's not what Garba yeah. Shehu, the spokesperson of Mr. President, uh, had to say recently. He spoke to newsmen uh, two days ago. He had to respond to all those who were saying that the president had not fulfilled his promise. In fact, he clearly stated uh, that the president uh, had inherited a, an economy that was in disarray, um, poor, a paucity of funds um, in the national reserves, and of course, uh, a country that had a Boko Haram that um, had taken over um, part of the country that was the size of Belgium. And this is in opposition to what you have just mentioned. Well, Garbashi would say that. I mean, he is known to lie, you know, habitually. He lies a lot. Everybody knows that. The whole world knows him to be a liar. So I wouldn't expect him to say anything different from what you're saying he said. But that he said it does not make it the truth. The truth is, yes, there was some economic disturbance uh, at the time where he was taken away. But that was a global thing. It wasn't just about Nigeria alone. Every country that relied on commodity to buoy their economy had problems. But these were problems that we had overcome before and that we would have overcome if we had a sensible government. I mean, remember Buhari came into office and he didn't appoint ministers for six months. He was the only minister, the oil minister, for six months. And guess what? There are problems with the, with the uh, accountability of oil revenues from the NMPC. Very serious problems. The oil revenues for 
the first four years of Buhari were not reported. There was no accountability whatsoever, and he is the oil minister. So the main source of funds for Nigeria, he was sitting on it, and the money is not accounted for. So we can safely say that he stole most of the money. We when, can safely say that. When you say the president stole all of the money, or most of the money, I mean, we can't make these kinds of allegations without having proof. Yes, we can, if we have no account. If there are no accounts, we have to assume that the money is gone. But again, the, pe the people who are saddled with the responsibility of making sure that these government officials, especially the executive, is accountable, is the National Assembly. But you have said also earlier on that these people are in cohorts mm -hmm. with Mr. President and they should also be held accountable. And they should. Look, I, I generally don't talk like this, but this has gone on for too long. This has absolutely gone on for too long. And, you know, Nigeria is at the end of its tether, economically speaking. Okay, these people have dragged us from the biggest economy in Africa to I think maybe third or fourth now. Okay, we don't even know how much we're earning. It's, it's absurd. Okay, so this has to stop. And we need to, act, Nigerians actually need to stand up now and start telling the truth. The pre, this president has stolen the country blind and he's handing over to somebody who also has serious allegations of corruption hanging over his head. Okay, so th these issues need to be addressed frontally. We, we, we need to stop, you know, uh, we need to stop pussyfooting around the, the real issues that are affecting real Nigerians and that are resulting in the deaths of millions of Nigerians. Gabashe who talked about Boko Haram. When Boko Haram, when, when the northerners uh, in general, a lot of northern politicians were agitating during the uh, uh, Jonathan administration that there should be negotiations with Boko Haram, that they should have amnesty and this and that. Boko Haram nominated Buhari as their representative. I don't know if you remember that. And I don't think they would have done that if there hadn't been some kind of back channel talk or front channel talk going on between them. So these are questions that need to be faced frontally for the first time. Let's, let's tell the truth, you know, or else Venezuelans will look at us and say, oh, therefore, for the grace of God, go we. Hmm. Interesting. Let's look at, because we're talking about this money and the, the level of indebtedness that Nigeria is at at the moment, because, you know, every time we talk about debt, um, most politicians will say, well, even the United States is indebted. And uh, I mean, yeah, so a, Nigeria's yeah, case should not be different. But, but yeah, what, that is so careless and reckless to say. I mean, but it, it's people that have, um, you know, no history of transparency, people that have clouds of allegations of financial impropriety in public office hanging over their heads. They're the ones that usually say stuff like that, such, you know, careless talk. But let's talk, let's look at how Nigeria gets to dig itself out of this hole, because we can't talk about the problem and not look at the solution. We can't. Yes. We really can't. The only way to get out of this hole is to recover all the monies that have been stolen, the billions that have been stolen under the Buhari administration. That's the only way out. How do, we, how, do sure that do that? how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we do that? Tinubu doesn't get sworn in as president because even Tinubu has started talking. I'm sorry. Uh, just hold on. What do you money. mean? But I'm so sorry. May 29 is sacrosanct, whether we like it or not. He has been. It's not sacrosanct. Hold on. It's not. It is the day that a president has to be. There's, there can't be a vacuum. It's we all know this. You know this. You know, know this. this. And I know this. Um, and again, we, we're not certain if the tribunal, what the tribunal's rulings will be. And I mean, it, it does not necessarily have to end on May 29. We've seen governors sworn in and then, of course, the court takes them out. We do not know. We cannot well, we preempt the courts the as we speak. We know the antecedents of the man that, that they, they want to swear in on the 29th of May. So my argument is that... Uh, a president elect is sworn in on the 29th of May is not sacrosanct. What is sacrosanct is that the president must leave. Now, if he leaves, there is an order of succession. There's a president, there's a vice president, there's a, there's a Senate president, and then there's the Chief Justice of Nigeria. All right? That's the order of succession. So if the president and vice president leave, 
the president of the Senate gets to take over office until the court decides who the actual president is. Because, look, you cannot swear in May 29, somebody. The Senate president ceases to be Senate president the on May 29. Clear. It doesn't the work that way. It's very clear. If somebody has committed perjury, he cannot be president. If somebody has a dual nationality, that but that's for the tribunal. Is that? But you see, you're preempting the tribunal. That's if for the tribunal to decide. Yes, the tribunal has to decide those issues before a president is. And sworn. that's why you and I can't say that February twenty nine, uh, May twenty nine, is not sacrosanct. Those issues must be resolved before the president is sworn. If they swear him in with the dual nationality issue hanging over his head, they have violated the constitution. They have plunged Nigeria into a constitutional crisis. Again, that's what they've done. What I'm saying is that you are preempting the courts. Let the there tribunal no do its here. job. There is a serious May allegation. May 29 is a day set aside there, to swear in listen, the president. There is a serious, listen, there's a serious allegation that this man is not loyal to Nigeria. This is fundamental. These are allegations that need to be proved understand? in the court. This is, this is fundamental to the existence of Nigeria. That still somebody who is not loyal to Nigeria is about to become the president but of still Nigeria. still has to be proved in now, court. That is, well, we've seen the passports. And the government of, Kona, of Guinea Conakry have already accepted that, yes, that passport was issued by them. It's a diplomatic passport. And diplomatic passports are not issued to people who are not citizens of countries. It doesn't happen. Okay. I'd, I'd say it again. These are all allegations that will have their pretend, day We cannot in court. pretend that the facts are not out in public. We cannot pretend. But then we can't sit on TV and decide who's going to be sworn in or not. Again, because that we cannot is the job of the tribunal. That the facts are not out there. We cannot pretend. So we are not saying, I'm not saying that the, uh, that the uh, tribunal should decide one way or the other. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, until that decision is made, it cannot be sworn in. So what do you presume will happen? On, I mean, because somebody has to be sworn in on May 29, whether we exactly. like it or not. So the Senate president can be the sworn tribunal in. The tribunal proceedings don't necessarily have to the end on the May 29. The Constitution makes clear. The Constitution makes clear a succession uh, uh, process. Okay, the Constitution is clear. So it is constitutional for the president to leave. It is also constitutional for the Senate president to take over when the uh, president and the vice president But his tenure ends elected. also when the president's tenure ends and makes way for the next yes. assembly. Yes, once it ends, once it ends, you know, and it there ends. is a constitutional crisis such as there is now. There is a constitutional crisis, whether we want to believe it or not. There is a constitutional crisis. But we crisis. cannot that, break the law in a bit you, to try I know to... That you practitioners, I know that you practitioners of journalism and the fourth estate of the realm have had all sorts of warnings and threats from official uh, from official quarters. So there are certain things that you should not allow on your TV station. But I will say what needs to be said. You don't have to say, you don't have to agree, but I'm saying what I'm what saying. What you're saying contravenes the, 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 the Constitution. It does not. It does. It does not contravene the Constitution. It does. It does. does not. You can't it make a Senate read, president read whose tenure ends on go May 29 back, listen, sit back, back in office. Your constitution. Go oh, back well, and I do know my constitution. And you will realize that nothing I've said violates the constitution. Absolutely nothing. Well, you're saying that the Senate president, from a government that is about to go out, needs to take the place of a president if there is no president sworn in. And I am telling you that yes. there is no vacuum. There has never been a vacuum. And at the time when we there had an interim no government, it was a totally there will different be, There will be no vacuum. There is no Senate president on this until the Senate president is sworn in. And the Senate president is not sworn in on the same day as the president and the vice president. That is a fact. But he's, his government ends on May 29, whether we like it or not. Yes, his government ends. That doesn't mean that government governance does not continue. The Senate president will take over. That is what the Constitution right. states. It's clear. Let's move away from this. We might come back to it. But let's talk about... Yes. Um, the, what lies ahead for the next president? Because, again, we're looking at paying off these debts. If the next president is Bola Tinobu, Nigeria is finished. Because he has already said that he's going to borrow, that he's going to print money, basically doing exactly the same thing that Buhari has done that has led us to a debt hole of $51 billion. Okay? He's going to do exactly the same thing. He's not talking about production. He's not talking about enterprise. He's talking about borrowing. Let's look at FDIs so we, and, and manufacturing and businesses, because as we speak, um, we our, oil, our oil has been stolen. 
if and we cannot have power if we have a government in place that does not believe in power. Look, the, the constitution has been amended to allow states to generate and distribute their own electricity. Okay, has any movement in that direction occurred in any of the APC states? Let's even start with Lagos State. Let's leave all the other states. Maybe they're not as financially viable. Has anything in that direction started in Lagos State? No. So what makes you think? And Lagos State is firmly in the control of Bola Ahmed Tinubu. Let, let nobody deceive you. Jide Sanwulu may be the governor, but, you know, he's a placeholder. And everybody knows that. Okay? So let's be factual. Tinubu will not turn Nigeria around. He will sink it further into a deeper hole than it already is. His standards are not quite the same standard as those of decent people. They're not the same. Huh. All right. The things that he accepts as ultra-modern or uh, progressive or whatever, they, they fall far below the standard that is required. But, but during the campaigns of the APC and those who supported strongly and still are supporting the president-elect, um, make they point to his governorship and his leadership here in Lagos State and all of the changes they said took place under his watch. Well, and they're look, saying that you, that's you the can't same really thing argue, he's going You can't to really receive. argue with people who have really low standards. You can't really argue with them. You know, you can't argue with people who don't understand that road construction is a basic, very basic function of government. You can't argue with people who don't realize that provision of water and electricity are very basic functions very, very basic functions of government. You can't argue with people who don't realize that ensuring that every child of school age should be in school. You can't argue with people like that. You can't argue with people who don't realize that public health care, the public health care system should work for taxpayers, at least, if not everybody else. Okay? You can't argue with people like that. People who at the, at the slightest bite of a mosquito, they jump on the plane, they are going to France for medical treatment. They are going to England for medical treatment. And it's not just Tinubu, it's all of them. I mean, he's just returned from a medical trip, hasn't he? Well, I, 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 did, I did have a conversation. In the, that built, in the Lagos that he built, there are no hospitals that can take care of him. I, I did have a conversation with um, a presidential spokesperson who was also campaigning on behalf of the uh, president-elect, who clearly stated in this studio, I do remember, uh, that um, the president-elect was going to put an end to medical tourism, was going to um, rejig our hospitals, and was going Buhari, to help Buhari our doctors said, stay back in the country Muhammad by paying Buhari. them the kind of monies they needed Look, and upgrading let, their let wealth. Me, let, me, let me say something about that. Let me say something about that. And I'll I, 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 I take, I take you back to the fascial administration. During the fascial administration, medical doctors in Lagos State went on strike for better uh, working conditions mm -hmm. and better welfare. And the strike was protracted. It went on for quite a while. It was a very serious dispute. And during the dispute, Bola Tinubu was seen on television telling Fashola to sack all the doctors that had gone on strike. There were over, there were just about a thousand doctors in the uh, employ of the Lagos State government at the time. And Fashola did sack them. He did. Now, it was this Tinubu that is now talking about attracting doctors back from abroad to Nigeria that had all the doctors sacked. He told him on television, two days sack them if they don't want to work. He said that. The footage still exists. Okay? Now, that person who was younger then and had better mental equity at the time is the one now talking about bringing back medical doctors and blah, blah, blah. How? The same person that we've seen on television saying, Bulaba, Bala Blue? No, I don't think so. Well, the, the, the issue, I, I will try as much as possible not to uh, make fun And there is a record, today. listen, there, there, there is, it is also on record that President Muhammad Buhari said during the campaign, you know, that people flying abroad to, for medical treatment, blah, blah, blah. He said a lot of stuff about it and said it would end. What did he do? He came into office and went to London for 107 days, packed the, the, the presidential jet at Stansted Airport at the cost of over £10,000 a day. So that alone, the, the, the parking bill for the presidential jet alone 
was bad enough. Not to, not to talk of the, the the medical bill that he incurred. I think they said it was forty million pounds or something like that. Now, what what in Tinubu's history shows us that he will not do even worse? What his pension package includes his pension his pension package with Lagos State includes a limitless medical benefit for himself and members of his family. So every time he falls sick and goes abroad for treatment, Lagos State is, is bearing the bill. Every time any member of his family gets a cough, they go abroad, Lagos State has to pay what? under the law. A law that was enacted when he was still governor. Interesting. We're going to go on a quick break. And when we come back, we need to talk about all the things that Nigeria needs to do to be able to pay back this loan, to be able to, I mean, I'm not sure if we can get debt forgiveness at this point, but what must we do uh, in order to dig ourselves out of this hole? We'll be right back. Uh, we still have Baba Tunde Badamosi here, a former senatorial candidate of the People's Democratic Party. Stay with us. It's still plus politics, and we still have joining us Baba Tunde Badamosi. He is a former senatorial candidate of the People's Democratic Party. And we're still looking at Nigeria's level of indebtedness, the state of the nation, and what to look forward to after May 29. Uh, Mr. Baba Tunde, thank you very much for staying uh, with us. Now, in eight years of President Buhari's administration, um, the Debt Management Office has said that Nigeria's total debt stock had hit about six, 46 trillion naira in the eight years of Mr. President's reign. Uh, they also reveal that Nigeria's debt profile has grown uh, from 12.6 trillion naira in 2015 um, to over 46 trillion naira. The situation has continued, like you and I have been conversing about. Uh, to raise fiscal worries, especially as the IMF uh, has said that Nigeria has almost em empty its treasury um, on debt servicing in 2022. In other words, we borrow and we service the debts, and we are also left with more debts to pay back. Now, let's look at if you were supposedly called on to be part of the um, economic team of Mr. President, and you were asked for your input as to how to pay this loan off or this debt or how we can even dig ourselves out of this hole what would be the few points that you'd be putting forth uh, to help us get out of this mess if it's possible well the first thing to do would be to block all leakages in the public sector there are plenty of them that's the first thing the second thing um Okay, I'm not sure that I should actually say this on air, but, you know, let's just say that uh, there are certain steps that government can take that will uh, see to the restoration of, uh, uh, you know, fiscal balance, as it were, you know. Um, but, you know, things, if things are done the right way, to paraphrase uh, 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 President Peter Obi, if things are done the right way, um, then the debts will be repaid. But if things are not done the right way, then there will be problems. What is One of the, the right first way? Things to do, uh, no, you said things, if things are done the right way, and I'm asking, what is the right way to do these things? That would be telling you, wouldn't it? That would be telling you. There are a lot of things that need to be done. But I, I, I will not um, mention these things on air for now, hmm. because um, I think that the I, I think that His Excellency Peter Obi will have a lot of work to do once he's pronounced president by the by the courts. But he didn't um, win the and elections, and, and I don't want to dwell on that. He had well, that, that is a he had two million less coming. votes. Um, and so he's not the, the winner. Matter for the courts. Exactly. The matter for the courts but until then, coming. our president-elect is... That is, that, is why I said, that is why I was clear that once the courts had pronounced him president, I was clear about that. 
Well, again, you're preempting the court because we do not know what the court and the outcome the of the case will be. Well, you are, you're clearly preempting the court. We will have a lot of work to do. No, we no, you're preempting the court. Whatever I, I the outcome see, no, of the tribunal instance, is, I don't see, I don't then we'll take it from there. I don't see fixing the debt problem. I don't see it happening. I think he will actually deepen it and make it worse. Based on his... This is, this is a man who's, who's spent his whole life being a godfather, putting people in office, as uh, according to him, being a well, well, I mean, he's he said he spent his time even as he was in the Senate. He's been a governor. He's according to him been a kingmaker, and he's in his is he's in his seventies. What does he have to lose? Why would he want to sink the country that he's begging to lead? Because he doesn't care. Because he if he to didn't leave care, leave why would he go through all the state, trouble to run for an office? Lagos State into a debt hole. Lagos State is indebted to over to the tune of over a trillion naira, and that is in the, that is in terms of the debts that can be seen. I believe that there are many other local debts that we have not yet identified. That when they come to the fore, we'll, we'll probably be looking at over four trillion naira in debt accruable to Lagos State. So you're telling me that. Man, so you're telling me that a man who spent so care. much money, time, and energy to want to be president of this country uh, will do it just because he wants to destroy the country. He wants to sink the country. Just because he wants to answer his excellency. That's all. Just because he wants to be on the list of people who are ever presidents of Nigeria. Can I That's ask you? Do, do you have a personal? beef with the president elect. Do you not like him? Absolutely. Well, I don't like his behavior, certainly, but I have no personal problem with him personally. I don't like his behavior. So if you call that beef, you know, I don't know. It's entirely up to you. But again, he's not going to be just your president. He's going to be the president elect, uh, or rather the president, if he's uh, when he's sworn in, he's going to be if the president. He's, he's the president he's of the whole country. When, and I'm guessing that if he succeeds, Nigeria succeeds, and you succeed, so why do we not if focus our attention is, on the things that can help him succeed when he becomes president? Again, I will be, I will be very clear about this. The election is up for interpretation at the presidential election tribunal. It's not a matter of when, it's a matter of if. And that completely depends on what the courts say. So it's not a, it's not a fait accompli, it's not a foregone conclusion that Bola Tinubu is the president of Nigeria just yet. President-elect, yes, but he's not the president yet. And so I would have us not preempt the court and wait until the judiciary completes the exercise that they're undergoing at the moment to decide whether he is, in fact, the president or not. But based on his antecedents, I'm going to say again that there is nothing in his history that suggests that he's going to do a good job by Nigeria if he is sworn in as president. Let's move away from that quickly. Let's talk about a few things before we wrap things up here. Let's look at um, some cases that were raised just before the elections. The fact that we had a lot of crude oil that was leaving the shores of this country unaccounted for. Money is not getting back into our coffers. The whole of last year, I'm sure that you, you would, I'm sure you'd know that the NMPC remitted zero into the nation's coffers. And this is supposedly our mainstay. And of course, we're dealing with refineries that have continuously gotten monies earmarked for servicing but have not produced or refined anything in so many years. And then all of a sudden, we're pointing fingers to the Dangote refinery and applauding that, oh, when, once it's up and running, then things will go right. But what about those other refineries that are lying fallow? Care to speak on it? Yes, that's a question that we should ask the Minister for Petroleum. I mean, let's not beat around the bush. You know, if we can't ask the Minister for Petroleum, we should ask the President, who just so happens to be the same person as the Minister for Petroleum. You know, the fact is, we have we, the, the longest serving minister in this administration is the Minister for Petroleum, who is Mohamedou Buhari. Let's ask him. 
where did the money from the NNPC go? Because the Ministry for Petroleum is the one supervising the NNPC. Where did the money go from all the oil? Why are there all these leakages in the oil sector? Why is our oil being stolen? And so when you asked me about repaying the debts, remember I said that we would have to plug all the leakages. And you've now mentioned one of them, the oil leakages. Now, um, the NNPC has been christened, rechristened, um, window dressed, um, and given all kinds of names to try to see if it would work. Many, uh, many people have uh, advocated for the privatization of the oil and gas industry. Is that something that, you're, uh, that you would give your approval to? I personally think that the Constitution should be amended, that the Land Use Act be either amended to give Nigerians freehold mineral rights and air rights over their land. The powers given to the governors over lands should be revoked from the Land Use Act so that the governor is no longer the uh, is no longer holds the land in trust for the people who trust that they have abused over the last twenty four years very violently. You know, so it's clear that the Land Use Act, as it exists now, only empowers corrupt politicians to exploit the people's resources and deny them the opportunity that the land presents for economic advancement. So the whole thing starts from the Land Use Act. Get rid of the Land Use Act. Grant uh, mineral rights to landowners. Grant air rights to landowners. And the whole privatization thing will start from there. Mm. Because if you own land under which there is oil, you own the oil. And then you can do with it whatever you like. But then, you but what about the taxes technical. that government would put on those products? This is, this is where the NEI, the NEITI initiative comes into play. The National Extract, uh, Extractive Industries Transparency yes. Initiative. You know about that, right? Mm -hmm. The one that was espoused by uh, Madame Obi Ese Brizili when she was in the Obasanjo administration. That is where that initiative comes into play. And all that needs to happen is that every wellhead, every single wellhead, needs to have a meter so that we know exactly how much oil is coming out of the ground. No matter what happens along the pipeline. If the pipeline gets vandalized, what about that business of the oil company? All right, it becomes their business to secure their own pipeline. Right now, because it's owned by government, nobody is responsible. Well, recently, if I'm nobody, sure, I'm sure that if you've been following the news, you would have heard that recently, um, a, a forty-plus billion um, naira contract was um, rewarded to uh, reawarded. I beg your pardon to um, government at Kumpolo, That's Tampolo uh, to protect mm -hmm. the pipelines, and and yet we have naval police. We have uh, uh, you know, our normal police forces on, well, the, on, on the our waterways and his, all of that. Some of his men came out. If you remember, after the contract was, his, was granted to him, some of, his, some of his men came out and identified pipelines from which oil was being siphoned throughout the Niger Delta. I think at one point they counted, they counted about 74 different illegal pipelines from which oil was being stolen. Uh, in the Niger Delta, and I'm told that they are, I'm told by people on the ground that there are far more than that. Now, these things happen again. I will stress because it is government property. There is an attitude in Nigeria that government property is nobody's property. It's a very terrible attitude. So we hear all sorts of stories about uh, collusion by members of the military in oil theft. We hear stories about collusion by uh, NMPC officials in oil theft, and so on like that. So now, if the people who are supposed to be looking after the resources are the ones actually stealing it, how do you stop it? The only way to take it forward is to privatize and then have uh, the NMPC or whatever it is stand as a regulatory organization, as an ombudsman, as it were, for that industry. And their job would then be just, you know, uh, supervisory, quality control, regulatory, you know, whatever. So that you would have meters on every wellhead. Every single wellhead must have a meter issued by, you know, the ombudsman or whatever authority. And it is from that meter 
digital preferably that we will be able to know exactly how much oil is coming out of the ground and how much it, our company wants a royalty has been signed, a sensible royalty. I'm not talking about uh, a punitive royalty. A sensible, very tiny amount of money per um, barrel of oil that comes out. You know, um, and perhaps it could be arranged in percentage terms, maybe 0.1 of a percent, 0.5 of a percent, something like that, mm. a barrel. And that will go straight to um, either the, it all depends, either the local government or the state government or the federal government, whichever one. And of course, you know that these companies will still pay their corporate taxes anyway. You know, um, one of the measures that could be taken for instance, uh, and I'm suggesting this, um, uh, I'm suggesting this purely speculatively, and I know that a lot of people will come at me for this, is that uh, whatever commodities we're selling that the world needs could be sold in Naira. Hmm. <laughs> Very interesting. We could, we could, we that's, could that, that's a whole different conversation on its own. I mean, uh, no, we, we, could, we could actually insist that you know you have to buy our oil in Naira hmm. so that whoever has their dollars and want to buy oil will have to come to Nigeria, sell the dollars, and, and buy Naira. Hmm. And, that will, and you think that, that this is help. going to help our Naira grow? That will do two things. It will, um, if oil remains, well, oil still has a shelf life of around another maybe 10, 15 years, um, based purely on the technological advancements uh, in the in the automotive industry right now. And I'm not talking, I'm not, I'm not talking just about cars. I'm also talking about heavy equipment. Mm. They're being electrified as well. Mm. You know, we now have electric bulldozers, electric wheel loaders, electric forklifts. Well, we had electric forklifts for a long time. We now have electric excavators, and there are electric ferries now, electric boats. Those are those those are actually a thing, you know. So, uh -huh. it's oil has a very short shelf life left. Now, in that 15-year window, what we could do is insist that um, you know whoever wants to buy from us has to buy in Naira, and uh, uh, the the BRICS uh, group of nations provides an excellent opportunity yeah. to, you know, make that happen, in my opinion. Okay. All right. Well, I want to say thank you. Um, Babatunde Gbadamosi is a former senatorial candidate of the People's Democratic Party here in Lagos. Thank you so much for speaking with us, and we really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. Well, that's the show tonight. But before we go, we will leave you with the highlight of all our conversations this week. Don't forget, you can also catch up most of our programs on our YouTube uh, platform. That is at Plus TV Africa. So go and play catch up. I am Mary Anakun. Do have a beautiful weekend. See you on Monday. The trend which has always led our sensors to be so controversial. The last acceptable census in Nigeria, um, which was not in any um, controversy, was the 1963 census. Since then, it has always been one manipulation after the other, one suspicion after the other. Uh, for instance, um, uh, let me give you a good example. Nigeria is the only country in the whole world where there are more people in the bushes, you know, in the, in, 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 in um, the certified areas than in the coastal areas. It runs against the, you know, the currency of thinking, currency of movement, migration anywhere in the whole world. Mm. So, and how does this happen? It's not the physical thing. You only need to go and stay in Baga or stay in some water. You see how many trucks of people are moving into the girls on a daily basis, you know, carrying passengers and dropping people off and all that. And many of them are not going back. Whereas, when you see that, or when you see the census, the figures you will have will be totally different. You know, so it's quite um, a very difficult situation. But we can surmount this problem by using technology and ensuring that you know everybody has NIN. Once you have NIN, you'll be captured on the system. Then we need to integrate the whole system in a way that it will be easier for any government, including authorities like Nigerian Police Force, EFCC, and others, to easily access information uh, without violating uh, people's privacy, but access information particularly when crimes are committed. Buhari 
and the man Tinubu are not are two different types of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, there is something that that Mr. Tinubu knows about people. He, he understands betrayal, and he knows exactly what Wike has done. And I want to tell you that even if Wike is a minister, within one year there's going to be a problem that is going to create a scandal just for him to to be exited from the place. I don't know what sort of what sort of agreement he's going to have and said I must be a minister for four years. I don't know how that's going to work out. But at the end of the day, there's something that Mr. Otu said, which I, I found very instructive. Why must we in the Niger Delta always be the cash cow for these people? Do they really respect us for who we are or the takes to exploit us for the resources that we have? Was Wike approached on account of his superior capacity and intellectual you know, um, prowess? Or was he afraid because he had the money and could turn and do the daily job? Even mm -hmm. my government, why was he made the chairman of the campaign uh, committee of, uh, of, of the PDP? I think we in the Niger Delta need to really come back and sit down and ask ourselves very critical questions on how our resources must be deployed at national level. The problem was this. Still on insecurity. An American was kidnapped. Somewhere in Africa, I was brought down to Nigeria. And the American president said he wants that American released alive within 24 hours. And from all the way from America, they came to Nigeria and they rescued that person. Is that all, is that all we saw purposeful leadership? And some people are traumatizing you in your country and you are calling a gorilla warfare. A gorilla walk here, and you cannot tackle it. Anyway, let's leave that because of our time. Let's leave it authority. Let's come to economy. Let's come to economy. What, what were the economic indices that made Nigeria the fastest growing economy in Africa pre 2015? Because the data are there. Not manufactured by me, but even by our our statistical bureau in Nigeria. All right, what were the indices then? What do we have now? I mean, I, I wouldn't want to use I wouldn't want to use words that that will not be easily discerned by listeners. But rather, I will go to the basic. In 2014 to 2015. What was our exchange rate? That's number one. What are the productive capacity of our industry? That's number two. When we're looking at when we're looking at rate of employment, what are we having then now? I mean, what are we having until now? How much was a bag of rice then? How much is it now? I'm talking about I'm talking about uh, uh, market price indices. What do we have then? What do we have now? Are you talking about economy? Listen, what what, what was the rate of of people, professionals, learned people, living our country then till now? I mean till now. It is just now that we are not having uh, I mean very loud Japanese syndrome. Now, Mr. the continuum. But this say because government is a continuum. We will now continue on things that that no that is not edifying us as a people. Whether you go to schools, universities, the house is appreciated. Okay. Whether you whereby a lot of people are now into unemployment, whereby our economy is going to degrade. Whether our refineries are not working, where are we putting money to, to make our refinery work? We are not borrowing money. We are not borrowing money. So give to people because we want to remove subsidies that this particular government said was a fraud while they were campaigning. Okay.